Exodus chapter 3. We're just picking right on up where we're at. I'm just staying with this till the Lord gives me a, a, a release from it. I feel like this is where the Lord wants us at, and I hope that we're uh, gathering uh, from the Lord through the teaching and that we're uh, applying and practicing, right? Uh, like the black man said, talk back to me and hear somebody. <laughs> Amen. Uh, who was that preacher that come here that time? Don, y'all know who I'm talking about. Tally, Brother Tally said, talk back to me, somebody in here. <laughs> Okay, uh, Exodus 3, we'll pick up in verse 13, and I want to share some things here tonight. Uh, Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. There's a lot of good teaching right in there. Verse 16, Go and gather the elders of Israel together. This is where we're going to focus tonight. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob, appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey. And they shall hearken to thy voice. The elders shall hearken unto thy voice, Moses. And we're still here at the burning bush when Moses is hearing this. And thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. Now let us go, we beseech thee, three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. I want to just uh, take a few minutes tonight and just teach along on something the Lord dealt with my heart about in these verses. Uh, I could probably take from verse 13 down through uh, verse 15, and there's a lot of good uh, teaching, a lot of good uh, things that we could bring out on God, establishing his identity with Moses of who he is. That's very important, okay? That not only did he say, I am, has sent you, I am that I am, but way all the way into the book of Revelation, we're gonna see that that name is still going forward and still carrying its authority, okay? So I could probably share a lot about that, but that's really not what the Lord gave me a green light, a peace about in my heart. I want to pick up here and just share with you, starting in verse 16. Verse 16 says that, and, and keep in mind that, that God is and Moses, they're still there at the burning bush, okay? A lot of this stuff we'll teach and we'll be uh, kind of teaching in prophecy that it's already happening, but they're still at this point at the burning bush, okay? And look what God said to Moses in verse 16. Go and gather the elders of Israel together, okay? I want you to let these, uh, Israel, uh, these elders of Israel know that I have surely visited you, okay? Now, keep in mind something that when God came to visit his people in Egypt, after they'd done what? Started crying out to him, okay? There's something about crying out to God, okay? And when they cried out to God, he came and visited them, and catch this, when he came and visited them and saw what they were going through, I mean, I don't want to make it sound like he didn't know, but I mean, he came near 
He got down there where they were going through it is what it's saying. And when he visited them, watch this, they didn't even know that he visited them. And I want, to, I want to just take a moment and say something right there that just because things don't change instantly or when you want them to change don't mean God didn't come down and visit you at your situation when you were crying out to him and, and calling on him because of what you were going through, okay? So when God came down and visited with the children of Israel and saw what was going on, they were going through, then he left there, if you will, and he went and met with Moses, right, in Midian, and God began to work on both ends of this thing for the deliverance. And we, we understand that, but some of this stuff is just good to just go back over it and read it real slow because everybody's in a different place, okay? And I just want to encourage you, that when you cry out to God and things don't shift in the moment, don't think God didn't come near and don't think God didn't assess and he didn't take inventory of the situation and make appraisal of what was going on and don't think he's not going to move because you can't cry to God and him not do something. And I'm not talking about complaining crying. I'm not talking about a mother standing in the window and the two youngins is out in the yard and they're complaining because one of them got the other's Tonka truck. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when there's a real cry, there's a, a parent is going to respond. And that's what God's doing here, okay? And look what he said. He said, he told Moses, he said, when you leave this burning bush, you know, and I'm just kind of prophesying of what did happen, then you go down there and the first thing I want you to do is gather the elders, Okay? And this is where I want to be tonight because this is where the Lord dealt with our heart about. Now, when we talk about the elders in church, we usually tend to think about overseers, uh, bishops, presbyters, pastors, people in leadership in the church. And we don't want to take away from that, but when he was talking, when he said the word elders here, what he was saying was in the original Hebrew, it means the aged elder generation, okay? He said, I want you to go to the elder, to the aged generation, and I want you to share your heart with them what I've shared with you, okay? And that's the order that God set this thing up in. Now, let me say something, that when Moses come back to Egypt, and I'm you know, this is significant, but you're going to know it. When he came back to Egypt, he was not the same man that he was when he left, okay? And that's what a real encounter with God will do for us. We won't be the same person that we was when we arrived back on the scene, if you will. An encounter with God will change a person's life. It, it turned... Uh, Saul in the Old Testament into another man. In the New Testament, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, Paul, look what it done for him. Look what direction he was going in and look what God done for this man in one encounter, okay? So I'm just telling you, uh, I wouldn't leave this earth without an encounter with God, but I wouldn't get discouraged in the process either. I would just pursue him. I would just pursue him. And if you, he told us, if you seek, you'll find. Okay? Now, I'm not too loud, am I? Okay? Now, what we've learned as uh, uh, aged humans, some of us, usually you can, get, you can get what you go after. It may not be what you need when you get there. Okay, so apply that principle to seeking God. If you seek God long enough, you're going to find God, okay? So just wanted to say that, and then I wanted to talk about these elders. Remember that these elders, these, this aged generation has been there. They're going through the same stuff that everybody else is going through. Okay, it's not like they've got a little mini revival going over here in Goshen and here comes the evangelist Moses to, you know, uh, throw fuel on the fire. 
No, they're in bondage too. They're going through the same thing that everybody else is going through. And watch this. They've been going through it longer than everybody else. Okay? So they're probably weary of the daily grind, the weekly grind, the monthly grind, the annual grind. They're probably more battle weary than anybody else. But yet God tells Moses, go to the elders. And there's reasons for this. And let me just say a few things about this. When, when Moses shows up to these elders, and I want you to remember something. This is God's people, and they're carrying covenant, okay? Remember back in Genesis chapter 12, God established covenant with Abraham, and this is Jews we're talking about, okay? So they're carrying covenant, but here's the thing about carrying covenant and looking at disappointment every day. Your covenant kind of gets dormant, okay? Your promise kind of gets dormant, because you're seeing, I mean, it's like, let me just give you a thought here. It's like, okay, I'm an elder in Egypt. Okay, every day it's the same old thing. Okay, it's the, it's the same. I set my lunch box in the same place every day, if you will, right? It's the same old thing every day. It's a cycle. It's a pattern. It's, you know, it's, am I ever going to, are we ever going to get out of this are we ever going, is this the way it's supposed to be? Is this the way life is supposed to be? And, you know, if you, if you entertain all of that, even though you're carrying a promise and a covenant, what happens is your covenant, your covenant and promise kind of lays dormant. It don't never die. It just kind of goes into, I would say, like a hibernation, right? And what happens is God stirs up Moses, gives him an encounter, and when Moses comes down that hill toward the elders, of course, we're going to learn and know that Aaron's with him by now, but when he gets down there, he's carrying something. This is important, church. If you're 40 years old and, and uh, uh, over in this church tonight, I want to talk to you tonight. I want to share my heart with you tonight. Okay, I'm not picking at your age because 40 was long ago for me. Amen. One fellow said, the other day told me at Walmart, said, just think of your age backwards. And I was sitting there thinking, I said, that'd be encouraging. I'd be 35. And he said, yeah, but I'm 55, so it won't help me none. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but anyway, he's a double nickel, ain't he? <laughs> Amen. But when Moses comes down that hill, watch this. <laughs> he's carrying something. He's carrying something. He's had an encounter with God. He's carrying hope. He's carrying an anointing that's going to destroy the yoke on God's people. Okay, hear me out tonight. Hope is going to come through what Jesus, or through what the Lord said before the yoke breaks. Okay? When, when we get a word from God, when hope comes, we got to capture that. Now, to the elder generation, we got to carry that hope. We got to carry a fresh encounter, a fresh anointing, because there's a lot of people that lives under the uh, heaviness of, is this the way life's going to be, even sitting here in church, right? We got to carry something that breaks something, that shifts something, that resurrects something in people, okay? In the scripture in Proverbs 13 and 12, it says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Okay, so just imagine the, the condition of these people that don't have hope and they're ever were out here too, okay? But it says when desire comes, it's like a tree of life. In other words, when hope comes, okay, to me, it's like a tree of life, okay? So it's kind of like in Luke 1 and 44 when uh, Elizabeth, which was barren for all them years, right, conceived and had uh, John in her womb, which was her promise, okay? What happened? Mary carrying what? Who? Jesus. 
When, when Mary walked into her house, John leaped in her womb at the greeting. <laughs> the whole atmosphere changed. You know why? Because she was carrying hope. She was carrying something that made promise move. You understand what I'm saying? She was carrying something that made covenant move, okay? And what was within her had to leap and move, okay? Shift, if you will. And I'm saying that to say this. All of these Egyptians, and especially these elders, these elders are carrying covenant, but covenant's kind of laying dormant right now. It's laying dormant. It's got the same power it was given, but it's got to be engaged through good news and hope and faith and believe in what God said, okay? So these elders are carrying covenant. Here comes Moses, okay? He's going to bring the covenant <laughs> giver, right? He's bringing the Lord, if you will, because God said, I'm, I'm going to go with you, didn't he? He, he said, you're going to do it, but he said, I'm come down to deliver him. So God is literally walking with Moses, if you will, here. Not, not in, they can't see him, but he's with Moses, okay? And I've shared with you several scriptures where it says the Lord is with us. The Lord is with us, and we're carrying that hope, okay? So the elders, amen, here, sometimes our discouragement uh, gets bigger than our promise, and we need somebody to bring a word for us. Now, let me say this. I wrote something down and I want to kind of go from here to there. People, many times, Christians, allow and we allow ourselves to get positioned and to get so discouraged that hope of a promise from God is so distant and sometimes so dormant that it requires an anointing to make it move again. To make, it, to make promise move, to make it shift, okay? I mean, Sunday morning, if anything was laying in you, it stood up. I mean, come on. That's the atmosphere of the Spirit of God when people just start obeying God and are sensitive to the Spirit of God, okay? I'm not boasting in what I'm going to say, but about 20 seconds into their song, I knew I was not going to get to preach Sunday morning. I mean, the, there was, it was just too rich. It was kind of like when me and Sandy's in Gatlinburg and she walks by a fudge shop, she stops. <laughs> she loves fudge. Huh? I'm talking about that fresh fudge. Or them Krispy Kreme donuts coming off that conveyor belt, <laughs> Sister Barbara. Whoo, mama. <laughs> You know, when the Lord comes in like that, we just want to just be like sponge, right? Just seize every bit of it that we can, okay? And so that's, that anointing, that wind, if you will, that move of God, we carry that. We carry that, church. We got we to gotta quit we got to quit looking. I preached the other Sunday morning. we got to quit looking at all these people in the Bible like they're generals and we're little privates in this army. Every one of them failed God. And they got up, they got over it, got up and got on with it, right? So we got to quit looking at it like that and we got to let the Lord raise our value as a son and daughter to the point that we walk in a confidence in the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. So today what happens, I see in a lot of ministries, is that today ministries will target younger generations. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but biblically I would like to say this, that I don't see biblically God jumping a generation, okay, to get to another generation. I'll give you an example of that. Joshua and Caleb wanted to go into the promised land. Everybody 19 years and younger, you know, they got to go in 40 years later, but God didn't stand there and say through Moses, uh, okay, everybody that don't want to go in, go on back to the wilderness. And all of you younger generation that want to go in, 
that's sitting there eating the grapes and stuff and wanting, longing to get in and Joshua and Caleb, y'all can go, no, God said, no, I, I got an order set, okay? And he worked from generation to generation, okay? And I'm going somewhere with that. I want to share with you. What I see is I see God biblically resurrecting a generation, a, a generation of elders, aged Christians, to pass and transfer to the next generation. Can I talk back to me, somebody in here? <laughs> Amen. I mean, I don't. I see the Lord putting a mantle on somebody, saying, "Carry it to the place to where your assignment, your mission is accomplished, and then pass it to the next generation." Okay, Moses, Joshua. You'll find problems when they wasn't somebody following Joshua, Elijah, Elisha. There was nobody behind Elisha to pass it to, okay? So let me show you something right here while we on that thought. Verse 18, when I read this the other morning, I just kind of wowed at this scripture. You ever just say wow when you're reading the Bible? Okay, verse 18, okay? Verse 17, he said, you know, go to the elders and tell them, uh, I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to bring you to a land that's flowing with, let me say it like this, with fatness and richness, okay? The deep good things of God is what I'm going to give you. Land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 18, and they shall hearken the elders, Moses, they're still at the burning bush, the elders shall hearken unto thy voice, and thou shalt come, thou and the elders of Israel, unto the king of Egypt. And ye shall say unto him, listen to this, the Lord God of the Hebrews hath met with us. With us. Now, I read the Bible here, and I'm going to teach something here, but I read there wasn't but one man at that burning bush having that encounter. And now God is saying, go get the elders, and when y'all get before Pharaoh, you tell him the Lord God has met with us. <laughs> let, me, let me give you something right here. Let's roll over to chapter 4. I'll finish that thought. Let's go to 427. And the Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. And he went and met, met him in the mount of God and kissed him. Now this is, this is a powerful verse right here because his older brother Aaron has not seen him in 40 years to our knowledge. Talk back to me, somebody in here. Okay? To our biblical knowledge. Okay? And now God, Aaron has no clue Moses has had an encounter with God at a burning bush. Aaron's in Egypt. And out of nowhere, the Lord comes to Aaron and says, hey, go, go meet your brother. And of course, let him know where he was, okay? So Aaron leaves Egypt and he goes out there and he meets Moses in the, in the wilderness. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord who had sent him and all the signs which he had commanded him, Okay? And Moses and Aaron went, they left together, and I don't know what, I don't know if Moses was kind of just lingering around, and I don't know what was going on here, but all of a sudden he's, he's kind of hanging out there, and here comes Aaron, his brother that he ain't seen 40 years. Now, you know, we just read over this stuff, but if you get anointed, you can get in that wilderness with them. You can be sitting there watching Aaron come across there, and there's Moses. And they didn't just, hey, yeah, God said, no, they... They had a little reunion for a few minutes or a couple of days. I don't know. I mean, they celebrated together as, you know, as this, this happened, this reuniting, okay? And then he began to share with Aaron what God had said. And Aaron spake uh, all the words. Let's see, we're in verse uh, 29. Uh, verse 29, he said, "'Gather together all the elders of the children of Israel.'" And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses. 
and did the signs in the sight of the people. Now, what we're dealing with here is that Moses just kept on telling God, you know, I can't do it, I can't do it. I can't even talk. And I, you know, I'm, I stutter when I speak. And so he said, oh, I, I, God got a little aggravated with him. He said, I'm going to let Aaron come talk for you. He's going to be your spokesman. Okay, you're going to be between me and him. Uh, he's going, you're going to be between me and him. And so Aaron, when he got there, Moses uh, began to show him the signs, you know, the, the rod. I, I'll back up later and, and hit that. The rod that he dropped down turned into a snake, okay? Picked it back up, turned into a rod. The, the hand that he put into his coat, pulled it out, it was leprous. Put it back in, pulled it back out, it was white as snow. I mean, here's Aaron and Moses out there by themselves. I mean, you're going to believe when you see this sign. These signs make you wonder. <laughs> Talk back to me, somebody in here. <laughs> Amen. So Aaron and Moses out there, and he showed him these signs, and man, instantly, boom, Aaron, yes, yes. I mean, now he believes because of, here it is. So let's go. Moses said, let's go to the elders. So they went to the elders. They got there to the elders, and they began to round up the elders because Aaron knew where the elders were at, okay? And they got all got together there, the elders, Aaron and Moses, and they began to show them the signs and share them what God said, okay? To stir the elders first and then the people, okay? You know, God does not want us that are carrying, even though our covenant, our promise, our callings, our gifts may be a little dormant here and there and need a good resurrection. He don't want to jump us to go to the youth and start a revival in them and let us sit here because we're the ones that's supposed to pass it to them. Amen. Talk back to me, somebody up in this house. Live streamer, talk back to me, right? We're the ones that's supposed to pass it to them, Okay. And look, the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel and that he had looked upon their affliction, and then they bowed their heads and worshiped, had a worship service, okay? So I wanted to just share that with you to kind of get you to where I want to go tonight because here's the deal. When they... God told Moses, when you get there, of course, Aaron's going to be with you and all the elders and then all the people is going to rally with y'all, but you and the elders are going to the king, to Pharaoh, and tell him, the Lord has met with us. See, if you got in the natural, you'd say, no, the Lord ain't met with us. The Lord met with Moses. But here's the deal. Here, here's where it's at. God gave there was something about God that when he, he got on Moses that that gets on them and they connect with it. They attach to it, okay? It's like it's really no different here. I mean, hey, the Lord is, is stirring, okay? He's, he's doing things amongst us. And somebody may say, well, Brother Jamie said, the Lord said this to him. He ain't said that to me. If he said it to me, he said it to you. Because <laughs> we're a family, we're a body, just like these people. And here's, here's what we got to believe. Listen, sometimes you got to walk mile markers without personal encounters with someone with personal encounter until your encounter comes. Okay? So really get a hold of that because when these people went up there and said, and Aaron was the spokesman, the Lord God has met with us. Well, he only really met literally with Moses at the burning bush, but when Moses came down to Egypt, are you ready for this? It's just a word just come into my spirit. Moses transferred the encounter on them. See, that's the way God's always set this thing up. He's always, when he gets ready to do something, he looks for a man or a woman. He sets them on fire and he brings dry people around them. 
See, that's the way God sets it up. Okay? And that's what he wants. My prayer is, Lord, baptize me in your all and then you light me from above. That's what I want. Amen? <laughs> that's what I want. Now, let's go to John chapter 20. I want to show you something while we got that thought open. Y'all with me? There's something about God that gets on him, then it gets on them, and that's, that's a beautiful thing. John 20, very familiar place. I want to show you something in the scripture. This is where Jesus has been, uh, you know, resurrected. The disciples hadn't, hadn't uh, saw him yet, but they're in a room. They're in fear, and they're there, verse 19 or so. Jesus just, out of nowhere, the doors are shut, and all of a sudden, Jesus just appears in his resurrected new body, and he appears, and he speaks. He stood in the midst of him, and he said, Peace unto you. And watch what he'd done. Watch this real close. When he had, he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. He showed them the sight, okay? Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord, okay? And, you know, he ministered to them a little bit there. And it, verse 24 says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came, okay? And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said ex unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. In other words, till I see and until I feel, I'm not going to believe. Okay, now I'm going to be honest with you. I'm a lot like Thomas. I like to, I like, I'm like Thomas. I mean, I want God to make a believer out of me. I mean, I'm, I'm just, you know, I'm not, you know, I want to walk by faith, but I battle, I want to see, I want to feel, you know. But here we have something going on that Thomas says, until this happens, I won't believe. Now, Jesus shows up eight days, verse 26, eight days, after eight days, again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Them three words are vital. Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, said, Peace be unto all of y'all. And then he got specific. And then he said, I came here to minister to Thomas. I'm just paraphrasing. He said, Thomas, reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And of course, we believe Thomas did this. We believe he saw the scars. We believe he took his finger or hand, thrust it into the side, you know, touched. We believe he saw and felt. And then he said, my Lord and my God, because I see and because I feel, I believe. Okay? And you can imagine that this service has just turned into a little mini eruption because, I mean, now Thomas is on board and they're all like, we told you, man, we, you know? And they're all just excited. And, and then the Lord says, hold on, I'm not through with my sermon. Thomas, <laughs> now everybody's fitting to learn from this. He says something right here. Watch this. Verse 29, Thomas because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. But blessed are they which have not seen and yet have believed. Now just ponder on that a minute because we everybody's preached to verse 28. But verse 29, Jesus is saying, I'm not, it, we're not at the benediction here. <laughs> don't, don't have too big of an altar call yet. I got something else to say here. And I want to say it to Thomas, but all y'all is going to get it. The reason you believe, and he's really, really, that's the reason they believed, ain't it? Because you've seen me. But he said, There's a, there is a blessing that rests upon people that have not seen and believe. 
Now that word blessed is interesting because it means, in the Greek it means supremely blessed. It means fortunate. It means well off. You want to know who somebody is that's well off? I tell you who somebody is according to Jesus that's well off. I've never seen Jesus, but I believe he's the son of God. Okay, that's a well off person that believes what he says without having to see it first. Okay, now let me give you something right here. <laughs> Watch this. If, you've ne if you're one of them people in life and whoever I'm talking to, if you don't feel good, you don't feel bad, you just don't feel, okay? And you're kind of right there where Thomas was. The best thing you can do is hang out with people that have had an encounter with him. Did, did you hear that? See, Thomas, for some reason, <laughs> it's a preach right here. For some reason, he hung out with them for eight days. Even when he didn't believe and he didn't see, he hung out with the right people for eight days. It matters who you hang around. I feel the Holy Ghost here. And I'm just telling you, Thomas hung out with them. He hung out with them. He hung out with them. Whoever I'm talking to, whoever hears this later, I don't feel, Brother Jamie, I don't believe. I, don't, I, don't, I ain't seeing what I want to see. I'm not feeling what I want to feel. Hang out with people that's had an encounter and just hang with them. Just stay with them. Because let me tell you, God always adds to encounter. And when he comes to add to encounter, you're going to be there present with them and God's going to give you something out of it, right? Uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 says we walk by faith and not by sight. And let me give you this scripture in 1 Peter 1 and 8, if I can uh, find it here. Uh, Peter is talking about Jesus. He said, whom having not seen, you love. In whom though now you see him not, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You know, a lot of people quote the last part of that verse, joy unspeakable and full of glory. That's talking about for people that believe and can't see it yet. That's what it's teaching. Now, here's where I'm going with all of that. Watch this. Without the elders, the elders have, have got to catch what Moses is saying what Moses is transferring from God, from the encounter to them. Okay, the saying we always, some, a lot of times we use, some things are taught, some things are caught. Okay, information is taught. Revelation is caught. Okay, so what Moses is doing, the reason they can get down there and say the Lord's met with us is because they didn't see the bush burning, but we just believe, right? We believe, we believe. Our hope, our, our covenant has been resurrected in us. There's a hope taking place of disappointment in our lives. And I'm gonna tell you something, church. God can give you hope, and it can be a year before you get a breakthrough. You can live on that hope, <laughs> right? You can live on it. You can live on it. Now, so without seeing the burning bush, uh, these people, these elders caught it. And that's what the Lord was telling Thomas, okay? You want to you stay with the people that are carrying something because eventually it'll get off on you. I mean, this is, pretty, this is a pretty simple principle, you know, you hang around, well, just take, just, if you put a youngin in a schoolroom that's a troublemaker, it won't be long, there'll be a troublemaker in the room that wasn't a troublemaker because he made a troublemaker. Yeah, talk back to me, somebody in the house. Really? 
And when you get around people that's got hope, even when you don't have hope and you don't feel it like they do, and you wasn't at the burning bush and you don't see it. And even, even if you saw a miracle or two, there's miracles in Egypt. There's Egyptian magicians in Egypt doing stuff. So this, you know, I'm just trying to tell you, but if you, if you hang around them long enough, hope seems to be contagious, right? You know, have you ever got around somebody on a job and it was just, they was just a complainer of the county, just negative and everything's wrong and this job and the this and that, and before you know it, you're talking just like them. However, that same way when you get around people with hope, right? You'll be, you'll be blessing yourself. Say, Whoa, I did it. Yeah, they've been doing it around me for weeks and then it gets on you. And I'm telling you, this is what happens. Like Sunday morning, <laughs> like Sunday morning when Sister Gary, uh, Sister, uh, Brother Gary and Sister Pam, yes, <laughs> I'll get my tongue untied in them. I'm like Moses. I need an Aaron. That's the Holy Ghost. But when this team got up here and got to releasing hope, you, you don't know what kind of shape people were in when they walked in this church. You don't know what they were, what they were going through. You don't know what they just left at the house. And then they got in an atmosphere of hope. And then everything starts, stuff starts shifting and moving. Promises start taking place of despondency and discouragement and depression, if you will, right? All right, so we'll move along here and we'll wrap up real quick. Uh, Elijah, the elder generation. Elisha, the younger generation. What did Elijah do? He asked he asked Elisha, what shall I do for you? In other words, what do you want? And of course, we know what he said, a double portion, okay, of the spirit that's on you. And I just want to paraphrase here. It's like Elijah was saying, you can have it because I carry it, okay? You can have it because I carry it, okay? And Moses carried it. And to the elder generation, we can't give what we don't have. Okay, we can't give what we don't have. And then can't nobody take nobody where they haven't been. And Moses, what did God tell Moses in verse 12, uh, Exodus 3? He said, this is going to be a token that when y'all get out of Egypt, y'all going to come right here to this mountain where you are. In other words, you can bring people where you've been, but you can't bring nobody where you hadn't been. Now, Moses is going to have to preach and walk in faith because he's never been to the promised land. He's never been there, but he said, God's taking y'all to the promised land, okay? Now, let me move along here. Just, just for my, my thinking, okay? Let's just say that one of the elders says, gets back home maybe and tells his wife, I don't lie. I, I, I see all of this. I see all of this, and I, I, even, I see a lot of hope and a lot of people's rallying and a lot of camaraderie and all of this going on, but I don't like the way Moses left us 40 years ago. Do you? See, the enemy's always going to stick something in your craw. Sandy, I won't use that word no more. She told me don't use that word. I'll try not to use it anymore. But, you know, I don't like the way he left. And now he, you know, he left. And, of course, I remember what he done when he left. And, you know, and here he comes back. And, you know, he's carrying all this word from God and all. And if I was his wife, here's what I'd say. <laughs> Do you like Egypt? Do you like Egypt? Do you want to stay here and keep up this old lifestyle? Is this what you want or do you want that? Well, I can answer that for you. I'm her right now. I'm going with them. All right? And if he's got any sense about him, he'll say, pack my bags while you're packing your bags. 
right? So <laughs> I thought that was a little Jamie verse, chapter 8, verse 3. And that's what we got to do, church. We got to, and I'm, I'm wrapping up here, but we got to stand in the doorway of the kitchen that Martha's in and look at that lifestyle. And we got to look in there in that living room where Mary's at and we got to make a decision, okay? That kitchen will keep you distracted from what's important, okay? So hope comes and these people's got to make a choice all right, I'm going with God and with the people of God, okay? So, and, I, and I'll share this. I want to go to Judges chapter 2. I want to read you something there. And, and I'll say this to everybody here that's 40 years old and up, and I just chose that. I just chose that number. If, if all of you here today capture what I'm saying if this church body captures what we're teaching that God is saying, then he's not met with me in my office. He's met with us, right? That's the way we got to look at it. See, God does not work through independent spirits. God don't work through somebody that don't want to be connected with the body. Okay, he's working through the body. Okay, now let me give you something here and I want to read this in closing over us tonight. Okay, Judges chapter two and I'm going to read verse six through 15. And when Joshua had let the people go there in the promised land, the children of Israel went every man unto his inheritance to possess the land and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord that he did for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. He was 110 years old. They buried him in the Mount of Ephraim, the north side of the hill of Gaash. And also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. It wasn't transferred. It wasn't transferred from one generation to the next. Watch this. And the children of Israel... That younger generation did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods of the gods of the people that were around about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. And they forsook the Lord, served Baal and Ashtaroth, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of the of spoilers that spoiled them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Church, our generation has a responsibility on it. Okay? Our generation has a responsibility. Them young people back there, them children and children's children, all of them, and all of some of you that's younger, we have a responsibility to keep praying, to keep fasting, to keep reading our Bible, to keep seeking God, to keep the fire burning. Leviticus 6 says, The fire shall ever be burning upon the altar. It shall never go out. Never go out. Okay, we have a responsibility to that generation. And if we don't transfer to them, pass down to them what God's done in our lives, let me tell you, one mile from the finish line is the worst place to quit. We want to finish well and live well off blessed, okay? So we can have something to give to them. Verse 15, Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil, as the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, they were greatly distressed. 
You look around today at the younger generation. They're distressed. I mean, you got teenagers that's in depression. You got teenagers stressed out. You know why? Because they're not getting what God put on the generation before them. Okay? Brother Gary said something the other night in prayer, and I want to close with this in one scripture. He said this several times, but the other night, Friday night in prayer, we were at the threshold of the third heaven. Sometimes we got to plow to get there, and sometimes it's like Sunday morning. We just walk in, and the Lord just, whew, you know what I mean? He just, whew, he's already blowing on us. So, Brother Gary said something. When he said it, I was just caught up like everybody else. He said, Lord, he was praying, and I love to hear this man pray. I mean, after he gets to praying, I mean, I'll tell you how much I love to hear him pray. Let me share this with you. When they called me to ask me to pray on the National Day of Prayer, I said, I'm going to pull one on them. I called Pauline. I said, Pauline, I might not can make it. I said, but if not, I got a staff member that can pray. And I'd have made sure I wouldn't have made it, <laughs> just so I wouldn't have lied. I was going to put Gary on the trailer. And she said, no, Brother Jamie, I want you to be there as a pastor. I said, all right, I'll do it. But that was what I wanted to do. And I would love for him to get caught up praying on that National Day of Prayer. I say that, that's just what I've done. Watch this. He said, Lord, I want my life to count for something. Listen to that, church. We're talking about in the kingdom of God. Lord, I want my life to count for something. That ought to be our prayer. I mean, that, that, is, a, that is an arrow of the Lord that goes into our heart. It says that ought to be you, okay? I want my life to count for something. I want, I want a Gershom. Y'all understand what I mean when I say Gershom, what I've been teaching? I want somebody in the next generation to be sitting on a church pew and say, I'm here because of the commitment Brother Jamie made. Okay, you understand what I'm not, I'm not saying I take the Lord's place. If, if, if this is even, if this is even, I, I don't even like to talk about this, but if somebody has to walk up to my grave one day and say, thank you for living for God, and answering the call, your life counted for me. That's what we want to live for. That's what we want to live for. All this other stuff in the kitchen, shut the burners off, man. Turn the burners off. Put them all on low if you have to and get in that living room and let God speak to your heart and help you to find direction. Watch this. Moses in Deuteronomy 30. Four and seven. I'm closing on this scripture. I want to give you this attached to what I just said. Moses died when he was 120 years old. He was in Egypt 40 years. He was in Midian 40 years. So when he leaves that burning bush, he's got one third of his life left to do what he's going to do for God. Now you look at your age right now. You look at your age and you look at lifespan of health being able to do for God. And that's something I'll never forget J.B. Davis told me. He said, Brother Jamie, while you have, and he was going down in his years. He said, while you have good health and you're, you have strength, preach the gospel. Obey God, the call of God on your life. And I hadn't forgot that. Let me tell you something. One third of his life is what he had left to do what he was going to do for God. That's it. And you know, if I, I'm talking to an age generation here today, everybody over 40, okay? I mean, hey, I'm, I'll be 54 this month. 54. 
I mean, if you add, divide up by two, what is that, 25, 26, 27? And if I live another one-third, I got 27 years. Hopefully, by the grace of God, have health to get Gershom's out, to get them out, okay? So you think about that. I mean, time don't wait on nobody, right? Like Michael Henley said, the weeks and days and weeks are fast, but the, uh, slow, but the years are fast, <laughs> Right? So, so think about that. That's why we should just forget, a, look, forget about those things which are behind, Paul said, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling, high calling, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So you think about that. If you got, if you got one third left to work for God, Right? We need to be doing everything God wants us to do that our life counts. That our life counts. Okay? Everybody good with that? Everybody good? I hope that challenges you. It challenges me. It challenges me to uh, redeem the time and do what I need to do for God. (laughs) 